it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Norman Sartorius. Son of a pediatrician, Dr. Sartorius earned his degrees in medicine and psychology, specializing in psychiatry and neurology at the University of Zagreb. He then spent two, two plus years in the UK on a British Council Fellowship. And at this point, he was irreversibly allied with a profession he considered to be in a miserable state. He has gone on to be psychiatry's living legend, asking the hard questions as he always had and leading the way. Dr. Sartorius's research includes schizophrenia, depression, stigma, health service delivery. He has served as director of the Division of Mental Health of the WHO, president of the World Psychiatric Association, president of the Association of European Psychiatrists, and president of the Association for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs. Dr. Sartorius is also an honorary member of numerous professional associations and advisory boards internationally. He is a force of nature, more than a legend. Um, so here I present Dr. Sartorius. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to give me so much. I have now to live up to this praise that you have given me. Can you all hear me very well? I have some slides which I'm going to try to show. Uh, can you see the slides? No. Um, can you share the screen? Uh, excuse me. On the bottom, the green thing that says share yeah. screen. Yes. There you go. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, am delighted to, uh, <clears throat> to be here. Although it's not, it wasn't very easy to get into this. This is just <laughs> due to my complete incompetence in matters concerning electronics and the internet and everything else. But uh, I'm learning as time goes by. Now, I wanted to, I was invited to speak about the mental health now in the future. And I want to say that we have uh, won very important battles in the recent years. We have uh, gotten the United Nations to recognize that uh, the, the mental health is important. They have put mental health, uh, achieving mental health and promoting mental health as one of the sustainable development goals. They have uh, done this on two occasions and they have even convened several conferences which ask the question, how do we get there? Which is very important. We have also, I think, other uh, achievements. The treatment technology, which, for example, has been described by Dr. Amsel just shortly before, has been uh, significantly developed. And for a large number of diseases, we have a now treatment, which will very likely help to people, not maybe cure them, but certainly help them and make them overcome the problems of mental disorder. We have also become much more aware of the importance of stigma and uh, there is a number of programs in different countries. There are programs in uh, Australia, in New Zealand, in Denmark, in England, in uh, Canada, in many other countries as well, which have started to work against stigma. Recognizing the stigma is really the chief obstacle in our, on our efforts to build uh, a mental health program. We've also increased the number of mental health professionals. When I started doing psychiatry that some years ago, uh, there were about uh, 80,000 psychiatrists. We now have 250,000 psychiatrists and much larger number of nurses which are specialized in psychiatry, a huge number of other workers, uh, psychologists, uh, social workers, etc. So many people have been added. It's not enough and certainly not enough in all countries, but there is a significant increase in the numbers. We have also wonderfully seen that the patients and family organizations have come into existence. They exist, they work, they're extremely helpful, and they do a variety of things 
uh, to both protect the right of the mentally ill and to help one another by experience and by concrete action, which is important. Human rights of the people have been recognized finally, and uh, not least uh, also by a recent convention, which is called the Convention of the Rights of People uh, with Disabilities. This is a convention that has been signed by uh, two thirds of the countries of the world, and by that has become obligatory to all countries. Uh, all of the previous documents have been declarations. The declaration basically says what we believe. Quiet convention says what you have to do if you are a member of the United Nations. There has been significant increase in the amount of research to mental health, which was very helpful. And then also gradually there is a recognition that we have to think about ways in which we can promote mental health, not only decrease the number of mentally ill people, but also promote the value which people give to their mental health and which will therefore enable them to, uh, to work for it and fight for it. But these battles, some of them have still to continue. Uh, I think that it's still true that it is a small proportion of people with mental disorder who receive appropriate treatment. In the developed countries, for example, in uh, European countries, 80% of the people who have severe mental diseases, such as uh, schizophrenia, uh, will get treatment. Not always ideal, but the treatment which will help them. In the people who live in the uh, third world, who live in the global south, 80% uh, to sometimes 90% of the people with similarly severe mental disorders do get no treatment at all. Protection of human rights, yes, we have been able to get these laws and uh, regulations, but it's still we are not still there. Uh, there are still countries in Africa, for example, which take as their example the law on mental health, which has been passed in 1898 in France. And there is a number of instances where the law exists, but for a variety of reasons, the human rights are still not protected, either because the uh, people who are in charge pay no attention or because there is no control or uh, for a variety of other reasons that are also there. Stigma, yes, I mentioned the number of countries in which stigma is being fought actively, Significant investment has been made in those countries, but unfortunately, uh, it still exists. And not only does it exist, but when we fight against stigma, it's somehow a separate part of the program. Fight against stigma must be an essential, central part of dealing with the program itself. It is just as important as any other element. It's just as important as helping emergencies. It's just as important as treating people who have the most severe form of disorders. Because stigma, unless it is removed, or at least controlled, uh, will prevent us from uh, providing care and will make the life of people with a mental disorder a misery. Education on mental health, well, it has been improved. Now uh, in uh, countries such as uh, the countries of the global south, we are seeing that gradually uh, mental health is being uh, added to the programs in schools and in, in universities. But it's still not particularly uh, applied, if you wish. There is, today we know, practically no disease that comes upon a loan. Disease appear together. And uh, very often there is a comorbidity between diseases, between diabetes and depression, or between uh, uh, cancer and depression. But it is still happening in most of the schools, even the most advanced, that we have separate treatment, separate uh, uh, teaching, about cancer separate for depression and the two do not get together, nor are they at the same time being discussed with a patient who needs to know them because he's suffering from both of those. And comorbidity still kills about uh, people with mental illness about 10 to 20 years earlier than those who do not have mental illness. So comorbidity is a major problem and we have to tackle it at the same time in our medical education and in the organization of services. As I mentioned already, in many countries, the laws concerning mental health are still outdated. They are not brought up to date. It is terribly sad to see that most of the laws that we have on mental health do not have what could be called a sunset clause to say, we are going to use this law until 2022, and then we are going to look at it again to see whether science uh, and uh, has brought new 
uh, knowledge, whether maybe the world has changed in some way, because other things that have happened, and this, uh, we therefore have to change the law. Uh, I think that while mental health research is much better supported than before, it is still far insufficiently supported. We now know that among the 10 diseases uh, in the world that are creating most of the disability, four are diseases of the mental health kind. And yet, when you look at the amount of money that is invested into research on cancer or research on cardiovascular illness and research that is in mental health, it is a disappearingly small sum that is being given for it. I mentioned the patient uh, organization, people who have mental experience of mental illness and family organization. They work very well, but they are very often not recognized and people don't want to listen to them. They say good things, but nobody has an ear open to them. And also, very often the organization of people who have experienced mental illness or their families, they work and they are usually led by one, two or three people. But when these people are busy or sick or not well or whichever, uh, the organizations fall flat and are not as operational and not as active as they used to be. Alcohol and drug problems are somehow hidden more and more. And we are talking now about um, cannabis being just a, a, a thing uh, which uh, is, uh, can be released without any problems. And other drugs probably will come in the same. But we have forgotten that we have to think about ways in which we can deal with the problems that are caused by the use of alcohol and drugs and by the increase of that use. And I think uh, we are probably investing far too little attention and far too little uh, money into this. Now, there are some developments in the world which are of great, great importance, which surround what we should be doing about mental health. The first of those I put here is the word commoditification. It's a terrible word. It's been invented by an officer of the World Bank. And it uh, basically says that expresses the notion that everything has to be treated as if it was a commodity, like sugar or uh, iron or timber. You buy it and you have it. You pay money and you want to get the same value back. So a statement about the hospital is now, it's a very well-functioning hospital. It makes profit. Now you cannot imagine that the hospital will make profit. In a way, what we are witnessing now is that the mental health as well as other health business has become an economic opportunity. While in fact, it is an ethical imperative. We should think of what ways, how to use the money in the best possible way to treat people. The notions that uh, a program should be done because the drugs which are used for it are cheap is not the right logic. And yet it was the logic that was used in the Lancet description on the World Mental Health Program, where it says we have to do this because the drugs are very cheap. It's not, that is not the reason. It's just an advantage to have cheaper drugs, but basically commoditification is set everywhere. Uh, and uh, blocks us and uh, puts forward questions such as, yeah, all right, yes, if you treat the mentally ill people, how many of them will function exactly the same level as before? How productive will they be, etc.? While in fact, we have to do this, hoping that productivity will also raise, but also thinking of recovery, of making people, giving them enough time to, back, to get back into normal life. There has also been a phenomenon of digitalization of medicine. We are now thinking that we can do so very much with machines and electronics and internet and everything else. Yes, great advantages. We can share data. We can uh, uh, find figures much quicker. We can also introduce telemedicine. But while these are all positive uh, uh, aspects of the entry of electronic uh, technology into our world, there is also the tale which is a significant amount of dehumanization of medicine. And we are seeing this by the huge increase of popularity of traditional healers in highly developed countries. In France, there are more traditional healers now operational than doctors because traditional healers listen to the patient. They listen to people's problems. They, they talk with them. Uh, while the electronic style makes you feel in, uh, uh, questionnaires makes you talk to your doctor while he is looking at the computer and typing something. Uh, 
it is dehumanizing medicine to a large extent. And we have to think of ways in which we can make the electronics help us rather than govern us. And then there is also the phenomenon which is very important, which is the fragmentation of medicine. Medicine is being broken up in ever smaller specialities. Specialities which are sometimes only one disease or only one organ. There are now orthopedic surgeons who only look into the shoulder, no other bones or no other uh, articulations are of interest to them. And even in psychiatry, there are now people only interested in uh, early interventions and others who are just specialists in uh, uh, manic depressive illness or only specialists in a particular form of psychotherapy. This fragmentation of medicine makes it extremely difficult to respond to people who are made of many, uh, diff with many different needs to which one has to reply or at least uh, uh, lend a, a sympathetic ear. Other, other phenomena are also important. Urbanization uh, grows with tremendous speed. Today, the most urbanized country in the world is Argentina. 96% of the population lives in towns. But they do not only live in towns, they also moved to town in the last 20 years and they moved individually. And so the ideas that we have a community which we look after people, etc., has to be revised because people in towns do not know each other very well. They live alone. In London, the most recent survey has shown that 30% of all households are single person households. And in China, they had to pass a law which uh, will punish children if they don't look after their parents. Because parents, particularly widowers and widows, had to hire somebody from the provinces to come and look after them because the children have refused to do it. And I think the notion of community as such in the conditions of rapid urbanization has to be re rethought. We have to, if we speak about community care, we have to think of who is the community? How do we keep it together? What do we have to invest to maintain it? What are the leaders that will be leading communities uh, so that they can operate? And even in countries of the third world, this is no longer the case. I'm thinking of uh, a place such as the provinces from which much of the younger people, like in Turkey, many of the younger people have, and able people, or in Afro, West Coast of Africa, many of the young people have moved to town to work, leaving the disabled, the elderly, and the mentally retarded at home in a dysfunctional communities in which you cannot really, it's nice to say we will uh, rely on the community, but there has to think of how to strengthen, restructure a community to make it operate again. And then there's this phenomenon, which is very recent, which is uh, the uh, horizontal communication. That people communicate with one another more and more horizontally. People with the same age, same profession, speak to one another, but they don't speak to their elders and they don't speak to their children as much. Not to the children, listen to them either. And so you have knowledge which is being spread horizontally, but the transition of experience doesn't happen any longer. And it is in fact, a significant danger that exists because of that. And then there is the demographic characteristics have changed worldwide. Uh, the, and I think that these demographic characteristics with an increased number of elderly and an increase and decreased number of children, which now in most countries of the world, they are practically the majority of children are siblingless, no brothers, no sisters. They don't learn how to live with somebody in the same house. Uh, when they are young, because they, there is nobody there. And even in countries which are previously at the abundance of children, even there, the number of children is sinking very quickly. And they are starting to worry what will happen with them. China being a wonderful example of that. But then there is also a tremendously important change of the role of women. Many of the women have gone out of the households to go and work abroad, uh, elsewhere. And that is wonderful. But what is not so wonderful is that all of the previous tasks which women have been carrying out so valiantly, transmission culture, looking after children, looking after the elderly, looking after harmony, building social networks, all of these tasks are still on their shoulders. So not only do they have to work to get some money, but in addition, they have to think of ways in which to handle all these things. And many of these things have because of that become uh, very much neglected and in a state 
that causes serious worries from the transmission of culture to the upbringing of children to the care for the sick in the house. Now, good things that have happened, yes, the self-help movement and mutual health movements, although they're in the infancy, they grow now. And that's very nice to see. The thing which they've done in Australia, the first aid for mental health, where people learn from uh, a book and from early instruction on what to do with minor problems, how to resolve them, uh, what to do when particular problems emerge in the family, how to help others, very helpful thing. Also helpful is the electronic information when it is used in the right way. And science undoubtedly will also bring us new progress. But there are new battles which we have to fight. And one of them I think is really to think of ways in which we can promote mental health in the sense of placing mental health high on the scale of values that people have. Because once it is high on the scale of values, it will motivate people to do things themselves to promote their mental health, improve it, and live a life of better quality. We should also continue to fight for human rights of those with mental illness because they are far from being protected sufficiently. We have forgotten that we have to think about primary prevention. We have produced a document for the World Health Assembly showing that more than 50% of all mental and neurological problems can be reached by primary prevention. There are many examples of those. I've listed a few here. For example, the additions to standard perinatal care, even if nothing else, but just by iodine supplementation could prevent between six and 12 million children born cretins because they are not receiving iodine supplementation. It's not psychiatrists who will do it, but psychiatrists and other people in the mental health field have to remind others to do it because otherwise trouble will occur. And there are many other aspects of perinatal care which one could enhance to promote mental health of the mother, the future mother, the mental health of the children uh, and the upbringing of children. Because these mothers, while they are expecting their babies are receptive to knowledge which can be given to them. We should also think of correcting mild sensory deficit. As much as 100 million children are dropping out of school because nobody has recognized that they are hypermetropic. They don't get glasses and they fail, they don't uh, get well on. Uh, I have a, a, a grandchild who was, uh, whose mother was invited to take the grandchild to the uh, this, uh, specialist for dyslexia because the, children, the child was not reading very well. But it turned out, and we discovered it at home, although there are three examinations per year in Switzerland for children, that in fact, the, she had a mild hypermetropia. When she got glasses, suddenly all the difficulties of reading disappeared. Now, a pair of glasses costs now 47 cents. And yet, if you look at how many people are in fact told that they should test appropriately the sight of their children and given them glasses, uh, which costs very little, less, significantly less than a bottle of Coca-Cola, uh, they don't still don't do it. Mild hearing deficit, same problem. Children are declared to be stupid. They don't reply, they are disobedient just because they don't hear very well. And maybe just by moving them from the last bench in the class to the first one would resolve their problem. Or even knowing that they don't hear very well might help them enormously. Another problem uh, that is of tremendous importance, particularly in the, uh, in the third world, is the uh, ways in which we can diminish the impact of stunting of children, which is the result of multiple problems which they have. And I think that that is another area which promises enormously. I mentioned comorbidity earlier. We have to think of other ways of dealing with comorbidity than we are doing now by changing the education of health workers, by changing the education in schools where people can learn about recognizing problems a little bit themselves and dealing with some of them. By also changing the attitude of the ministries, which very often separate departments uh, in different areas so that the Department of Communicable Diseases doesn't really talk to the Department of Psychiatry. Although we know that many of these diseases will appear together and that all of these different uh, departments should find a way to do things jointly. 
We should also think about what has been called the non-specific aspects of treatment and of living together. There is this booklet that has come out. It's a funny little book that came out in New York. I think it's called The Rabbit Effect. And basically it describes, it is all based on a uh, observation. There was a group of people uh, who were doing some experiments giving uh, rabbits uh, a very heavy um, diet, which was supposed to create uh, heart problems in the rabbit. And they did this and the rabbits were getting these heart problems and they're dying from the heart problems, except for a small group of rabbits, which did not seem to be behaving in the same way. They ate the same food, all right, but they didn't seem to die as much. And when they were looking why this was so, they discovered that one of the uh, assistants who was lab assistant, who was looking after these rabbits, who, uh, some of them, in fact, liked them, uh, spoke to them, sometimes sang to them, uh, played with them a little bit. And the attention which they gave a woman assistant giving to rabbits made the difference in the mortality rate in rabbits. Now, we are forgetting the tremendous power of being nice to one another and helping one another when in trouble, which is what uh, Jerome Frank and others have called the non-specific aspect of treatment, which according to all the results which we now have, are approximately 20 to 30% of the total effect of treatment. One third is the drug or the medication or the specific treatment method. One third is the placebo, which says, oh, you have treatment, must get better. And one third are the non-specific aspect of treatment, which we are continuously disregarding, although they should be driven into the head of the doctors and other healthcare, but also the population in general. Being nice to one another is a very important mental health tool. And then it's, I think, important to also for all of the health workers to think about acquiring communication skills because these are not taught and many of them, many of us don't have them from birth. Skills of listening, skills of convincing others. In order to convince people to give iodine in the diet, to provide the iodine, you have to convince them and you have to have a skill which will help you to convince people. And that skill can be taught, it can be learned and can be used. Leadership skills is another group of those where people are put in charge of a department, put in charge of a group, but do not know how to lead. And yet they could learn it if you just paid a little attention to do that. So the, the revision of education, I think, is very important as well. We have to change the education about psychiatry, not only by uh, the content, but also by the place where it is done. If you want to speak about anxiety in a person who is expecting a heart problem or, or a heart operation, go to the department of uh, cardiology, not the department of psychiatry to teach that. You should also think about other people who can teach psychiatry. Carers, for example, parents of a person with schizophrenia have a tremendous amount of knowledge which they can offer to others. If they are invited and given the, the place in the education of students and others because they, they live with patients 24 hours a day. They know very well what needs are and what needs to be done. And I think we should also think about, particularly for psychiatry and these branches of carefully selecting people who will enter into this field because not everybody is made for everything. And so I think that a little bit of talent, a little bit of leaning, a little bit of skill goes together with knowledge and learning uh, to make somebody a leader in his field. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that the future of psychiatry or mental health is very bright. Uh, and provided, that is provided that we should invest ourselves sufficiently. Uh, and I think if it does, if we invest ourselves and do sufficiently, we'll not only improve the fate of people with mental illness, but we will also diminish the occurrence of many non-psychiatric disorders and will improve the quality of life of those who work in our field and everybody else in the community. And maybe if psychiatry and mental health are really properly weighed, it may also help to return some of the soul to medicine, which is in a danger present, uh, possibly in a danger of disappearing. I thank you very much for your attention.
Um, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I do have a question about uh, wh where you get your optimism from. Um, when I think about psychiatry and the future, I think about the increasing number of trauma that the global population is exposed to and uh, how inadequate um, our resources will be to support mental health, uh, much less existence. Um, and figuring that part is, figuring out that part, I think is also part of the future of mental health and psychiatry. You know, how to make communities resilient against trauma. Um, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think that the number one is we have to understand and accept that uh, what has been written in books of psychiatry and books that are relevant to psychiatry has been written about 50 years ago and not revised since. Uh, we are living in a different world today. Uh, so that uh, to read these books that we have done before and to teach what has been done before is not really hitting the target fully up. And so that I think that the, the, the the first thing which we should do is we should really re-examine the education of different categories of personnel to see to what an extent this education and its content and the form is adjusted to today's world, not to the world of yesterday. We have done a survey recently of a textbook of psychiatry, and I've seen that there is practically no change whatsoever in the description, on the main description. Maybe the medications are different. Uh, uh, some of them have been added, and some of them have been discovered since. But the total fabric of society having changed, we have to think of where do we intervene, when? Why don't we teach children of six uh, problem solving, for example? It's a technique that is being used by psychiatrists and by general doctors who are clever, but it's a technique that in a modified form could be taught in elementary school, and children like it when it was tried. So that there is a the first thing which we really have to do is we have to shake up what we are currently doing and see which of the techniques, ways of training, ways of doing things are still valid and which needs a replacement or a change or a modification. So I think that that would be the number one that I would say. And then we have to recognize that all this talk about global health uh, and global global is not really applicable. Uh, people are still very different and we have to be, yes, global, we have the idea that we should help people. That's a global notion. But how we do this must be strictly local and we have to give uh, credit to the local people when they're doing things. In our studies that we have done on stigma, for example, we have in the beginning relied on surveys that we have done research uh, uh, studies that have been done to examine the level of stigma and its types, et cetera. And then we built programs on the basis of that, and it didn't work. Uh, in Calgary, for example, in Canada, uh, we have had this uh, thing in which we know that uh, attitudes are formed in certain ways, and uh, therefore we have to, um, places which promote attitudes, we have to think about uh, putting the right uh, text in there, in the right pictures, etc. And then we went to the people who had mental illness in their families and said, Tell us, please, of all the things in your life, what disturbs you most uh, in, uh, that we could change? And they said, well, we thought that they will say that it's, they are disturbed by the fact that the newspapers are writing about crazy people or that they will, that they are um, um, not uh, getting uh, these jobs, etc. But the first thing which they told us was, uh, you know, we would like when we have a physical illness, and when we go to the hospital, we'd like to be tr treated like human beings, like others, and not like crazies. Do that for us, then we'll talk further. So we did that first. We dropped the program as a whole and exclusively worked with hospital staff. And uh, the hospital staff were very unaware of what they are doing, the ways in which they speak, words which they use putting somebody to wait longer, etc. Uh, and when we did this, the things changed and the P 
people who had mental illness came to us and said, you're the first one who ever heard, listen to us uh, when doing a program against stigmatization or any of that type. And gradually we build other things in that way, but the leader in that particular program have become people who have mental illness and people who are their family, not anybody else. And that was, a, we've dropped the research findings uh, and said, very good, oh, kind. The research findings apply to everybody, but I'm not everybody. I've never met myself an average person. They're all somehow non-average. And I think that that is also applicable in our field. We have to think of adjusting our knowledge uh, very much to what the situation is like and using local forces, uh, using a strategy, what I would call maybe enlightened opportunism. When opportunities emerge, we should use them to improve situations.